I get the short straw on this one because I went through the whole AGD84 to GDA94 transformation going back now, oh, that would have been around 2002-2003. When we did that shift or when we did that transformation, we were talking about 200 metre shift. So it's quite a significant piece that's going on. Don't you love it when these clicker machines don't work? Um, so what we're seeing, but today, this is slightly different. As, as Isabel mentioned, we're talking about 1.8 metre shift. In reality, a 1.8 metre shift is that much. Think about it. That's, that's not a lot. How many of you in your room can tell me that your data is more accurate than three metres? One. How many of you out there, or two or three, I saw, saw a few more up there, how many of you out there actually go out with a theodolite or a um, GPS receiver and use an RTK and actually capture data that's sub, sub centimetre or sub metre accuracy? There's a couple of you, a couple of you. That's just interesting. The reason why I ask these questions is most of us don't actually know how accurate our data is. And if you think about it, we've got cadaster up here at the moment. Because it comes from the government, we think, yeah, it must be pretty accurate. In reality, a lot of these parcels that we see here were actually captured off paper plans, which were actually originally designed with chains. So yes, the parcel up there may be five metres long along its frontage, or 45 metres long its frontage, but that was when we, they were measured in, in chains and yards and all that sort of stuff. So it may, be, it may be, maybe that sort of thing. So that's one of the problems we're encountering right now, is that, yes, the relative accuracy. So what are we doing? Well, we've got actually two phases of transition going on. In um, 2020, uh, we will actually be moving our projections or our datums to 1.8 metres from where we are right now. Stage two is more of a dynamic datum. So after 2020, what we'll be doing is the ICSM and Geoscience Australia will actually be implementing a dynamic shift. As we you heard a moment ago, Australia is moving at about one point or about 70 millimetres a year. So that's about that much. It's really relevant because a lot of people have been saying to me, oh, does that mean I've got to move my data every year? Well, no, you don't. What it really means is that there is an understanding that it data does shift, but in the short term, we really don't have to move our data that much at all. So what's us as Esri Australia, what's our role in this? Well, in what I've been doing, I've been working quite closely with ICSM and Geoscience Australia, trying to understand exactly what this means to our end users. Uh, and what I've been doing, and what we've been doing is liaising with Esri to ensure that the products that you work with in your daily GIS work support this. And that's really important because I've been fielding a lot of queries recently about that. What versions are supported? What products support it? How do I go about that? Well, what we're doing now is we've ensured that these products do work for you. So things like ArcGIS Pro, uh, 2.1 is the minimum version that you need to support that. ArcMap, that's going to support it as well at 10.6 and ArcGIS Enterprise at 10.6 as well. So we fully support the transformations in there. There's some apps in, in ArcGIS Online that do require a little bit more work, but they're coming on stream now. So we support the transformations in several ways. The first way we support this is there is a conformal uh, seven, or oh, sorry, there is a seven point parameter transformation that is there. The seven point transformation is a mathematical model that allows us to actually transform the data uniformly across the entire continental plate. ICSM is also releasing several uh, NTV2 grid files. And the grid files are binary files that actually do the transformation for us. And they predict where your data will go over that period. So we support the com new conformal one, which is a generalised seven parameter conformal uh, model, but also one with local distortions. So there's a whole series of points around Australia where the actual measurement of the distortion is being kept and we understand the movement. So this, which one do you use as an organisation? Well, that very much depends on where you are. I can't tell you. You need to go onto the, um, the GA website to actually find that out. 
So the way we support these transformations is in ArcGIS, you will see one of three methods there if you've got the NTV2 grids loaded. If you don't, then you will only see that first one. But don't worry, We've, we have information on how to do that. So if you're running on 10.6 or Pro 2.1, then you do need to go to the download, down to the ICSM website or the Geoscience Australia website, pull those down and put them into your software. Really importantly though, at 10.6.1 at and Pro 2.2, we now have this, uh, this basically this coordinate system software that you download as an additional download and install it. And Esri is doing this because there are other countries who are going through the same process as what we're going through. So America in 2023 is going to be doing the same thing. There are several of the European countries are also going to be doing the same thing. We've all got some sort of plate movement. So what Esri's decided to do, rather than bloat out our products, we will actually have a coordinate system download and one install does pro, desktop and server. So you can run it across all of those. So where will you see this inside ArcGIS Pro or inside ArcMap as well? Well, there's two geoprocessing tools that you might use. One of them is project. And when you do that work, you actually pick the data up and you project it to a new coordinate system. So that's where you would actually use that quite often. Second one is when you get a data set and you want to go define projection on that data set. You unknown coordinate system. So you're actually setting that up. The third place, which is where most commonly most people will do it, is in their map document or in their, their data frame, where you actually want to define the projection that you're going to be working in. Importantly, what about 3D data? Who's got 3D data? Yeah, a few of you. Um, I bet you can't tell me though whether it was captured in the Geoid 92 or AHD 71. That's really important because there is actually a separate transformation that exists between GDA 94 and GDA 2020. And I, some data with GDA 94 was captured on the, the reference ITRF 92. So if you know where, how you've captured your height data, then there is actually a nine centimetre downfall on that Z data that you're working with. Nine centimetres, it's not that much. So do I actually need to do it? Well, or do I need to think about this? If you've got traditional map data that is uh, X and Y, then no, not really. If you've captured data in AHD 71, then no, not really. But if you've actually gone to the effort of capturing your GDA 94 data correctly, then you do need to think about it. Unfortunately, at the moment, none of our products actually support this. It will be coming in a short while. So 10, what are we at? No, 10, 6, 10, 7, and uh, 2. Pro 2.3 will support that in our products. Let's move on to actually discussing the migration. One of the things I will say straight up front is do not say to your colleagues, we're going to do our transformation tomorrow. Believe me, it's not a simple upgrade because you're taking your data and you're transforming your data into a new database. You are creating new feature classes. So things like relationship classes, you need to consider things that are associated with your existing data sets. You need to think about things like what else is dependent on that data set that I'm moving. How complex is your environment? So a lot of people in their databases today, they have, they have triggers. When you put some data in, a trigger fires and something else happens. If you're moving your data somewhere else, you need to think about what's going to happen. And then really, you need to think about how I'm going to go about this. What are the other systems that are going to be affected? Because the project tool, which is what you're going to use to do this transformation, creates new features, it creates new data. In some ways, this is actually a really good time to think about if I was going to replace my database, this is an excellent time to also think about doing your transformation as well. Let's think about your data sets as well. This is really important because everyone goes, oh yeah, I've got some vector data that I need to transform. Let's go back one step. Let's go back to sort of 2002, 2003 when we did the GDA 94 transformation. We had vector data. We might have had an, an annual image or maybe a once every two year image data set. And that might have been it. We had some of the shape files and we had some other bits and pieces maybe in spreadsheets, but there wasn't a lot. But if you think about the 
the explosion of data that we've got now, many of us will have hundreds of feature classes. We will have LiDAR data, which is X, Y, and Z, and is captured in GDA 94, UTN zone 50. We will have imagery data sets and elevation data sets, but also we will have caches on web services that are also in that datum as well. There are web services that are built off of that and MXDs that are built off of that as well. So the downstream effects are not just the data that you start with, but it's everything else that you're building up around that. So you do need to think about those types of things. It is also really, really important to think about creating a plan. So what I traditionally do is I will take a data set and I will do a manual transformation and put it out. But if when I have 1,400 of these data sets or 2,000 of these data sets, I don't want to do every one manually. So it's really good to think about using Python tools to start scripting this process as well so you're not doing it one at a time. And also, most of us will have things like a roads layer and we'll have a footpaths layer and we might have a rivers layer. Think about when you're actually going to put it out, why don't you actually label it so it's roads GDA 2020 so that you don't get it mixed up with your original data sets. And I can't emphasise this enough archive your old data because you don't want people coming along and using that old data. And then once you've done it, once you've done that Python script and you've gone there, test it. Do it once. No, no, do it twice. Do it three times. Make sure you're comfortable with the data because by the time you go to migrate this, you'll understand exactly what's going on and you'll be prepared for the migration. One of the common questions that I actually hear is people say, well, when should we migrate? And, th and other people say, well, what about the state governments? What are they doing? When are they going? And well, what I'm generally hearing in those spaces right now is people, the, the state governments with their cadastres and their zoning boundaries and those sorts of things, they're looking to start delivering early next year. I know for South Australia, for example, where I'm from, our government's already done all the parcels once. They've already done all the ancillary data that goes with that, and they are committed to delivering in February next year. So we're going to start receiving both GDA 94 and GDA 2020. One of the hardest things is not just the data, but it's the tools that you use out in the field to capture with as well. So some of those GPS devices won't have had their firmware updated to capture in GDA 2020. So there's those sorts of considerations as well. So what's dependent on your data? What, what, when you do this, think about your map documents. You're going to have hundreds and hundreds of MXDs. A big organisation will have a lot that are all GDA 94, UTM zone, something or other. You're going to have web mapping products. I know in South Australia where I'm from, the state government actually serves a lot of their stuff out in Lamberts, SA Lamberts, which is on the GDA 94 datum. So it's going to have to move to GDA 2020. So all those web maps are going to be redone. All those web services that are dependent on that as well are going to be done. But as I say to them at the bottom, the very last thing is one of the hardest things to do, which is you've got all these vector and tile, all these tile caches. So you've got fast maps with tile caches in underneath that might be in the associated projections or datums. You need to think about how you're going to migrate those as well. So it's, again, it's coming back to it's not just feature classes. There's a lot more data associated with that. And then, this is where it gets really interesting now, is that we have enterprise systems today. So some of our big utilities, they'll have asset management systems which hang off the GIS. And they're dependent on that information. If you go and move that data, then they, you've got to go and update all those asset management systems. But the one I really like is that second one on the list there, which is the coordinates that reside in the data that aren't linked to geometries, the individual coordinates. You need to go and find and discover all those coordinate tables and say, OK, they're 94. I now need to actually create maybe another set of coordinate tables with the GDA 2020 location. But it's only that far. It's not a lot of, it's not a lot of room. Um, and finally, think about those databases, what's in there and the triggers and the views, all those sorts of things, because there are a lot of downstream effects. Let's talk about something that's really important now. So I've said that this is 1.8 metres between GDA 2020 and, one, and GDA 94. Traditionally, when we've taken information from GDA 94 and we've put it into Web Mercator, we've accepted that there's a null transformation. So in our Web GIS world, we just go push, and it fits and it sits in the right location. So if I take a GDA 2020 data set and a GDA 94 data set, 
and I push them together, they should reproject. But if I push them over a WGS84 datum, there is no projections going on both, so they will be both 1.8 metres out. There will be a shift between them. There is no datum transformation that goes on when you mix your datums together. Really, really important to remember that. So what does it really mean? Well, I start with my data in GDA94, I transfer them up, and I push it to GDA2020 and pull it back out. What I'm saying here is do not mix datums. Keep them strategically placed. Because of that 1.8 metre shift that you've got there, when we bring it into the WebGIS, we will get a displacement if we decide to mix datums. There's also something really interesting up there as well. You'll notice that red line that's there. Today, we actually don't have a datum transformation between GDA 2020 and WGS 84. What does that mean? Well, currently there is, if I was to transform one across, I'm actually going to be somewhere in a three metres out. Why is that? Because, believe it or not, WGS 84 has had time realisations in it. Every year, the, st the, federal, oh, the American government has actually moved and adjusted the time realisation of WGS 84. So when you're moving your data from GDA 2020 to the WGS 84 web Mercator environment, you actually don't know which of those particular WGS 84 time realisations or movements, dynamic datums, that you're moving to. So Geoscience and ICSM have said, well, we're not going to really put a datum in there at this point, a transformation at this point, because we can't actually guarantee where that's going to end up. Importantly, though, the ESRI base maps that you're going to put this stuff on top of, you can still plonk it on top and it will work. You can still work with it in that space. What we will see once we hit the dynamic datums, we will see a datum transformation come in that will give us 20 centimetre realisation over the top and we will get very accurate ones come through. It's something really, really important to remember. So what I'm saying there is don't mix your datums. But you'll have web services come from other service providers and you need to be aware of what those web services are. So be very aware of where your data is coming from and where it's going to. So what do you do? Well, for the time being, it's really important to, if you're going to publish data to the web, if you've moved data to GDA 2020, make sure all your data is in one datum, either in GDA 2020 or GDA 94. Don't try and mix them together. Always transform them to a common data set first and make sure that everyone's aware of what that common datum is. Because if they don't, they'll start to mix data and you'll get mixed up. And because it is only 1.8 metres, you may actually not know that you've got mixed datums in there as well and not see that. So be aware of that. It's something that in the next five years, we're going to have happen a lot. And it's something that we as ESRI Australia and ESRI can't actually control because of the fact, the way the datums are all configured. It's every software out there that works with this. So here's some examples. So we're inside ArcGIS Pro now. So I've got a GDA94 data set sitting there on the screen. And we can see that the spatial reference is in zone 54. Happens to be South Australia where I live. You can see also what we're looking at there is that data frame is also set up to be, w is set up to be um, zone 54 in GDA 94. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to go and grab a GDA 2020 data set and we'll overlay that on top. Now you'll notice there's no messages, nothing telling me about a transformation or anything occur there. And if I go and have a look, just to be doubly, doubly sure on that, we'll see that, that, yes, that is actually a GDA 2020 data set. Because I haven't, I've just brought it in and as it is, we'll actually notice that there is a 1.8 metre shift that goes on there. And you can see that there quite clearly in between those two cadastre data sets. What you can do inside ArcMap and inside ArcGIS Pro is you can have this automatically transform the data for you on the fly as well. And you'll notice here inside ArcGIS Pro, we've actually got a transformation capability. When we go and grab that, you'll see there are the three datum transformations I spoke about and the NTV2 grid files there as well. Grab one of those and you'll see it'll actually update. Those two now align perfectly on top of each other because now I'm transforming one back on top of the other. We've got perfect alignment and that's what we expect in that space. What happens then when... Oh, that's just showing you exactly where those GSB files are stored as well, with the NTV2 grid files are in the software itself, 
so you can make sure that they're there if you don't get the alignment. What happens then if we go and take the datum or the data frame and we go and put it in WGS84? So this is what we're going to do now, the traditional web Mercator that we use for our web mapping. Mixed, mixed datums, watch what happens to those two. That's the misalignment you're going to see. So that's what you need to be aware of and it's really, really important that you're aware of that component. So what about stage two? So I've been speaking about what we're going to do in the next year, next year and a half, that sort of thing. What about when we get to the dynamic datums? That's a really interesting area because what it starts to mean is I'm moving my data by this much. I get data shifts by this much. Do I need to move it every year? No, not really. In reality, you may not even need to move it every five years. It depends on how accurate your data is. I bet most of you in the room can't really tell me how accurate your data is, what the relative accuracy is. But there are situations where you've got assets, you've got utilities, where you're going to need to update that kind of information. So we're going to have tools inside the software that will actually pick up the, date, the epoch that you put against the data, and then we will move that data as a geoprocessing service across for you. It won't do it dynamically as far as I know today, because that will cause too much confusion. So we're going to actually have a geoprocessing service and we're going to see that happen through the next versions of software. It will start to appear. We have lots of resources out there on this. So we regularly write blogs and put them up on our web page about what's going on in terms of the 2020 migration. Geoscience and ICSM are also publishing lots of information. One thing I do recommend a lot of people do is they go and identify some key coordinates in their data set they then go and transform those in their data set, go up to the ICSM website and put those coordinates in and see that the coordinates that they plug out are the ones that match your ArcGIS environment as well. So go and look at those resources and these PowerPoints will be available for you to have a look at as well afterwards. And finally, we do provide quite a lot of information and we're continually updating the technical blog on what to do and how to go about doing this and where to put those GSB files and where to go get the software from and the things you should look at and the things you consider. So all of the information I've discussed here is everything that we've got up there as well. But also we're providing consultancy services as now. There's a free one hour consultancy service that you can come and talk to our professional services guys that goes through a lot of what I've discussed today but more detail as well. And then we can come in and actually look at your environment and go through everything in detail exactly what needs to be considered and relative time frames. I know I've got one organisation that started looking at its um, database and uh, when they did the transformations inside the database they were taking two, three hours to do and when they did it inside in Folger database it was taking maybe 20, 30 minutes to do. So sometimes you need to consider where this transformation is going to occur. All I can say right now is plan. Plan and expect. There's no point you moving as an organisation until your corporate core data sets actually move and start moving. So the people are delivering to you that your underlying data that you don't maintain. Once your web services start moving, then, then you start to move yourself. Do you have to move in 2020? Not really. I mean, say when we moved from, from 84 to 94, it took five to six years to move everyone to get across. So yes, you're going to start getting data delivered. Yes, it's going to, it's going to come. But really, it's not something you have to do tomorrow. It is something that you will consider over the next year or two. Thank you very much, and I hope you found that information useful. <laughs>